Happy New Year. Grace to you and peace in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Good morning and welcome to this service of worship on the second Sunday of Christmas. We are Kirkwood Presbyterian Church in Springfield, Virginia, and we're glad you're here with us this morning. And we hope you'll feel embraced by the love of Jesus Christ as we worship together on this first Sunday in the year 2021. We'll be projecting the order of worship on the screen as we go along today, but if you'd like to have a copy of our bulletin, you can download it on the church webpage. That's kirkwoodpres.com. While you're there, if you're a first-timer, you might consider filling out our new visitor form. You can tell us a little bit about yourself, and if you wish to, you can leave your email address and we'll add you to our email list which is a great way for you to stay informed about what's going on in this congregation and our ministry within the neighborhood. Whether you're with us today on Facebook or on YouTube, we hope you'll consider adding a, a note in the comment section to let us know you're here and to say good morning to your fellow worshipers. Today, it is my great pleasure to welcome again to our pulpit, the Reverend Hilaire Henthorn. Hilaire has been with us before, and today she will be preaching and celebrating with us the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. In addition to being a Presbyterian minister serving in the D.C. metro area for over 20 years, Reverend Henthorn is a retreat leader, a public speaker, and a juried professional artist specializing in acrylics and mixed media. Since 2019, she has served as an artist in residence at the Innova Shar. Cancer Institute in Fairfax, where she guides patients and caregivers and staff through a, a variety of artistic projects. You'll have a chance to greet Reverend Henthorne immediately after worship today when she joins us in the virtual narthex for a time of fellowship. And don't forget, there's also a fellowship hour every Wednesday evening at 6.30. Instructions and invitations for both of those online meetings can be found in your weekly This Week at Kirkwood email, which comes out from the office on Thursday mornings. If you're not already getting This Week at Kirkwood and you'd like to be added, just drop an email to our office manager. She is office.manager at kirkwoodprez.com. She'll be very happy to add you to the list. And now, with joy and gratitude in our hearts, let us prepare ourselves to worship God. Confite mini domino, quoni iam bonus. Confite mini domino, alleluia. join me in the call to worship. A man named John came to witness to the light, but he knew that he himself was not the light. The true light of the world, the word of God, by whom all things were created in our Lord Jesus Christ. From his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. And we have seen his glory, Glory of a Father's only Son. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please join me in the gathering prayer. Eternal God, a thousand years in your sight are like a watch in the night. For generations you have led us, and we look to you 
for our hope and happiness in this life and as our eternal home. Guide us in this new year and always, so that our hearts may learn to choose your will. Grant us strength to carry through with the good things we resolve to do. We ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Now let us sing hymn 121, O Little Town of Bethlehem. This time of confession is our opportunity to rid ourselves of anything that might separate us from God and neighbor. The gift of God's grace is lavished upon us, poured out like water through the life and death of the risen Lord. Trusting in the love and goodness of God, let us confess our sin. Let us pray. Holy God, you have given us everything but we have failed to respond with gratitude. In Jesus Christ, you have given us your word. We answer with empty promises and lies. In Jesus Christ, you have given us your light. We try to hide ourselves from your glory. In Jesus Christ, you have given us your life and even this precious gift we have not received. Hear us now in the silence as we offer our personal prayers of confession.
Have mercy on us, merciful God, and forgive us. Through our Lord Jesus and by the power of your Holy Spirit, give us faith and power to become what you created us to be, beloved children, full of grace and truth. Amen. Friends, this is God's promise, the sign and seal of your redemption. You have been called by God, claimed in Christ, set free through the Spirit. Hear and believe this good news. In Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. And now, let us share signs of Christ's peace with one another. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And also with you. And also with you. And with you. And also with you. And also with you. And also with you. And also with you. Good morning, everybody. At this time, I'd like to invite all the kids watching at home to uh, gather around your screens so that we can have our children's message. I remember walking into a class one day at college, and I'd gotten there a bit early. So I walk in, and there are only a couple other students sitting there. Uh, and I nodded a brief hello and sat down. And then after I arrived, there were a few more students that came in. And um, I noticed that we were all dressed pretty much the same. Everybody was wearing jeans and a sweatshirt, something like this. Everybody was wearing a pair of sneakers like this. Pretty much everybody had a backpack like this. And everybody looked like they were about the same age. Well, we're sitting there waiting for our teacher to arrive, and then a guy who was sitting next to me said, hey, do you know anything about this professor? I mean, is he any good? You know anybody who's ever taken one of his classes? I said, no, I've never had him and don't know anybody else who has either. So this fellow then started asking a bunch of the other students who had come to the class, and they didn't know the professor either and didn't know anybody who had. So we continued then to wait and wait and wait. The minutes were dragging by. And I remember we were all staring at this big clock on the wall, wondering where in the world our professor was. Well, at that moment, the fellow who had spoken to me earlier suddenly got up from his desk, and he walked down to the front of the classroom, and he introduced himself. He was the teacher. And we were shocked. Shocked to find out that the person we'd been waiting for all that time had been sitting in our midst, and we didn't even know it. Now, how come we didn't figure that out? How come we didn't recognize that he was the teacher? I'll tell you why. Because he didn't look or act the way we expected a professor to. We thought he'd be wearing a nice suit, right? Not jeans and a sweatshirt like we were wearing. We thought he'd have a really nice pair of shoes on, not some beaten up old sneaks like we had. We thought uh, that he'd be carrying a fine briefcase, but like this, right? Not a raunchy old backpack like what we had. And um, we expected, frankly, somebody older, somebody with some wrinkles, maybe even some gray hair. So, again, this person that we had been waiting for all that time had been in our very midst, 
and we had completely overlooked him. Well, in today's Bible story, Jesus' cousin, a fellow by the name of John the Baptist, is receiving a group of very important visitors, other pastors from Jerusalem. And by the way, they do not like John. Since John is a pastor like they are, they feel like he should be wearing the nice, fine, long, flowing robes that he wears, not a short, rough-looking tunic of camel hair. They feel like, since John is a pastor like they are, that John ought to be eating the same kinds of things they do. You know what John eats? Very limited diet. He eats bugs and honey, just bugs and honey, which they think is really weird. So John doesn't look or act the way that they expect a pastor to. Now John talks with these visitors and he tries to explain to them that he's been sent by God to prepare the people to meet God's son, Jesus. And then he tells them something really startling. He says, and you know what? The one who's coming after me, the one who's even more important, way more important than I am, he's already among you. But you don't recognize him. Why? He doesn't look or act the way you would expect him to. Well, sadly, this group of very important pastors, they decide that John has not been sent by God. They also decide that whoever this other person is that John's referring to, who we know is Jesus, God's son, hasn't been sent by God either. So think about this for a minute. These men who think they are so close to God, who know so much about God and God's teachings, reject the very two people, John the Baptist and Jesus, whom God has sent to help God's people. This story is a reminder that it's not up to us to choose um, or decide who, can, uh, who God can work through. It's not up to us to decide who God can choose to be God's helper. I mean, God's helpers can be short, they can be tall, they can be bald, they can have tons of hair, right? They can be any age, any size, any race. They may be people we like, and they may be people we don't like. But the important thing is that God loves us enough to send us helpers, helpers who are probably in our midst right now, even though we don't necessarily recognize them. And we can be thankful that God loves us enough to send us the people who can help us the most, like John the Baptist and like Jesus. So will you take a moment and pray with me? Dear God, help us to remember that it is not up to us to decide who you can and cannot work through, who you can and cannot choose to be your helper, but God, let us be truly grateful for the great love you have shown us by sending helpers to us in every age, those who love us and bring us important messages from you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. For us and our salvation, our Lord Jesus was willing to come down from heaven, and truly he became one of us. Let us therefore gather up a portion of the bounty with which we have been blessed, and offer it in gratitude, and let us rededicate our lives in service to God, the giver of life.
let us pray. We give you thanks, God of all creation, for the power of your life-giving word, making the winds blow and the waters flow. Receive these gifts from our hands and use them to bring peace and blessing to all your children. In Jesus' name, amen. As we come to this time of prayer, I invite you to turn to the final page of your bulletin where you'll find the list of joys and concerns for this congregation. And now with praise and thanksgiving in our hearts, let us go to God in prayer. Almighty and ever-present God, as the old year closes and the new begins, we lift our hearts in gratitude and anticipation. For most of us, 2020 was a difficult year, but you are a God of new days and new beginnings. By your grace, you have seen us through, and now we look forward in hope to a new year filled with new possibilities. Help us to use this time to rededicate all we are and all we have to you. We know we are far from perfect, so we ask that by the power of your Spirit you would make us truly penitent. Help us to grow more deeply into the image of our Lord Jesus. Pardon the sins of our past and empower us to begin the year with fresh faith and renewed zeal. Grant us grace and wisdom to live with our neighbors in peace according to your loving purposes so that others may better know you through our words and actions. As the Christmas season draws to an end, we thank you once again for the great miracle of the Incarnation and for the incomparable gift of our Lord Jesus. By his example, may we be guided to be a bold witness to your light in a world that desperately needs it. Grant us strength to follow him in faith until all have come to repentance and are reconciled through his love and grace. God, we pray for those who seek healing of body, mind, or spirit, including our friends Celia, Bob, Millie, Dick, Joanne, and Claire, and others whose names we place before you now in the silence. God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. As we continue to live through this alternate reality of pandemic, we pray you would hear the cries of those who have lost loved ones and those who have fallen ill themselves. Be with and bless all who labor on the front line, those who willingly accept added risk in order to serve others. By the power of your spirit, keep us mindful of the needs of those around us for whom life was already difficult, and COVID is just one more burden to bear. Be with and hold safe all those living in war zones or areas afflicted by famine or drought, those without a roof over their heads or a reliable source of nourishment or adequate medical care. Have mercy on your children who live in fear and grant that we may be their allies and advocates on their behalf. God, we pray for our leaders and for the leaders of all nations. By the power of your Holy Spirit, inspire them to seek peace at home and abroad and to exercise wisdom and compassion in every act of leadership. Help them to work for reconciliation between groups and factions. God, we thank you for inspiring women and men to embark upon lives of service including all those who serve in our armed forces. Bless them and bless each family that waits at home for their return. We thank you also for the faithful witness of the Church of Jesus Christ through the ages and for all those you have called to share his good news in places far from home and family, including our friends now serving you in Japan and Zambia. We thank you for loving us through all of the times of our lives and for being a part of our celebrations. 
This week, we celebrate with Jeff and Amy, who have an anniversary, and with Andrew, William, and Dick, who have birthdays. Loving God, you alone know what 2021 will bring. Help us to be patient and faithful as we embark on this new year. Teach us new and better ways to love your people and to be your church in this age. We ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning is from the Gospel of John, chapter 1, beginning at the 19th verse. This is the testimony given by John the Baptist when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and didn't deny it, but said, I am not the Messiah. And they asked him, well, what then? Are you Elijah? He said, I'm not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. Then they asked him again, who are you? Give us an answer for those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now the priests had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him, Why then are you baptizing if you are neither the Messiah, Elijah, or the prophet? John answered them, I baptize with water. Among you stands one whom you do not know, the one who is coming after me. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. This took place in Bethany across the Jordan, where John was baptizing. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Several years ago, I was serving in a church in Alexandria. One Sunday morning, I arrived a bit early for worship and found a man sitting in the sanctuary on the chancel steps below the altar. He had long, stringy, greasy hair. He wore old clothes, which were stained and torn. He had neither shaved nor combed his hair. He sat quietly speaking to no one, and no one spoke to him either. I figured he was one of the homeless men from Route 1 who wandered into our church periodically. As the church members arrived and the pews began to fill, people stared and pointed at him. Many talked about him right in front of them, some of them quite loudly. I heard several people ask, Who is that man? What's he doing here? Then other comments followed. He looks filthy and he probably smells bad too. Doesn't he know how to dress for church? Couldn't he at least have bathed and made himself presentable before coming here? I think somebody ought to ask him to leave. I agree. Maybe one of the ushers will escort him out of here. It turned out that the man was an actor hired by the pastor to dramatize an event from the Gospels. The man was playing none other than Jesus, the Son of God, the true light. I was startled and shaken as I thought about the congregation's response to this man. We come to worship every week, preparing ourselves to be in God's presence. We come each week seeking an encounter with the Holy One, We come, in theory at least, with a willingness to be open to the ways in which God chooses to speak to us, to stretch us, and to transform us. 
Yet, when faced with someone who doesn't match our expectations of what God looks like and how God acts, we reject the idea that God is present. And then it dawned on me that we're no different from the Jews of ancient Palestine, who also had strong opinions about how and through whom God can act. Like the religious officials who confronted John the Baptist, we can get so caught up in our egos, our power struggles, and preconceived ideas that we miss God's very presence among us. Often our resistance to somebody new or unconventional is actually resistance to God. Let me say that again. Often, our resistance to somebody new or unconventional is actually resistance to God. Scottish pastor William Barclay put it very well. He said, the best way to prepare for the coming of Christ is never to forget the presence of Christ. When we meet up with John the Baptist in this text, he's in hot water with the religious authorities back in Jerusalem. Strange rumors are reaching them about the crowds that John is attracting and about baptisms being performed in the Jordan River. Now, their issue with John isn't that they're priests, but he's not. After all, John is the son of a priest named Zechariah. His mother, Elizabeth, is a descendant of Aaron, Moses' brother, who founded the Jewish priesthood. To qualify to be a priest in ancient Judaism, you had to be a descendant of Aaron. And if you weren't, no amount of study, devotion, and training could make you eligible. So as far as these other officials are concerned, John is a priest. He isn't, however, behaving like one. He doesn't look the part because instead of priestly robes, he wears a shortened camel hair tunic. He doesn't eat a diet of normal kosher food, but limits himself to locusts and wild honey. Oddest of all, he's engaging in a weird ritual of baptizing Jews and others in the Jordan River. It's important to remember that baptism was done only for converts to Judaism. Jews weren't baptized since they already belonged to God's people and they didn't need to be washed unlike Gentiles. John is being questioned by trained scholars and priests who are experts on God's teachings. They devoted their lives to studying God and all things holy. So they want to know, who is this guy? And by what right is he performing these so-called baptisms? When they find John, they get right to the point. Who are you? And notice that John answers by saying, who he isn't. I'm not the Messiah. Perhaps the investigators were thinking that they could charge him with blasphemy if he claimed to be the Messiah. So they try again. What then? Are you Elijah? John replies that he is not. Okay, are you the prophet? Again, John says, no. At this point, the officials are becoming exasperated because this game of 20 questions is getting them nowhere. They ask him one final time, then just who are you? What do you say about yourself? Give us an answer that will satisfy those who sent us. John then quotes from the prophet Isaiah, I am the voice of one calling in the desert, make straight the way for the Lord. The reason the officials asked John if he's Elijah is because many Jews thought Elijah's return would signal the arrival of the Messiah. Their question about whether he was the prophet was based on God's promise in Deuteronomy 18 of a prophet like Moses, but even greater than Moses, who was also believed by some to be a herald for the Messiah. John's consistent denials make clear that he is not the Messiah, but rather one sent by God to announce the Messiah's arrival and bear witness to him. In verse 24, John shifts, John's interrogators shift their focus. So if John isn't the Messiah, Elijah, or the prophet, then where does he get off baptizing Jews? 
In what name and by whose authority does he presume to act? Because he sure as heck doesn't have the approval of the temple. Now it's John's turn to shift the focus. He ignores their question about baptism and focuses instead on Jesus. He tells them, among you stands one whom you do not know. John tells them that this person is coming after him and is far greater than he. John adds that while he baptizes with water, the one coming after him will baptize with something other than water. To emphasize his inferiority to this person, John says something truly shocking. I'm not even worthy to untie the thong of his sandal. Now this was an astonishing thing to say in the ancient world, since not even slaves, not even slaves were expected to untie their master's sandals. John points beyond himself to Jesus. In effect, he tells these officials, don't focus on me if you're looking for the Messiah. Look closer to home. The Messiah is already among you. Like you, he is a Jew. He is a Pharisee. He too is a preacher and a teacher. Already he is among you. And although he is, you don't even recognize him. You don't see him for who he really is. John's reply repeals that these uh, officials aren't truly seeking the Messiah. They seek to preserve the status and the authority of the religious establishment. Really, they want to put John in his place. They seek to curtail any exercise of religious authority that they haven't initiated and approved. In fact, they seek to limit God. They reject the idea that God could be working through John to lead them to the Messiah. They don't bother to pray with John and talk with him further upon receiving this startling bit of news. They don't attempt to discern for themselves whether John has been called to this time and place of service by God. They assume he has no business doing what he's doing in God's name. They assume that if anyone is fit to be a herald for the Messiah's presence, it is they. And since they don't perceive the Messiah's imminent arrival, then the Messiah ain't here yet. It's as simple as that, because they would know if anybody would. God would notify them first. So those who see themselves as responsible for seeing God's light and proclaiming God's truth can do neither They don't ask John where they can find this Messiah who's already arrived. In fact, I think they overlook or dismiss John's amazing and humble declaration. He's already among you. Like many of us, they're so caught up in their own sense of importance and superiority that they miss God's presence in their very midst. By rejecting this priest with the kooky wardrobe, weird food, and wild ideas... They're actually rejecting God. And it's just as hard for us to grasp that God is already among us as it was for many in ancient Palestine. In 1996, the musician Joan Osborne recorded a song called One of Us. In the song, she declares that God is both great and good. Then in the refrain of the song, she asks, what if God was one of us? Just a slob like one of us. Just a stranger on the bus trying to make his way home. Some Christians were really offended by these lyrics, claiming that they were sacrilegious. We don't mind hearing about the greatness and goodness of God, but we draw the line at the idea that God could be in that disheveled, unappealing, grungy stranger sitting next to us on the metro. Christian activist Dorothy Day said, it's no use saying that we are born 2,000 years too late to give room to Christ, nor will those at the end of the world have been born too late. Christ is always with us, always asking for room in our hearts. But it is now with the voice of our contemporaries that he speaks, with the eyes of store clerks, factory workers, and children that he gazes with the hands of office workers, slum dwellers, and suburban housewives that he gives. 
It is with the feet of soldiers and tramps that he walks. And with the heart of anyone in need that Jesus longs for shelter. Dorothy Day put her finger on the problem. We have to have the heart of someone in need to receive Christ and recognize him as the one who stands among us and who is one of us. We must not be so full of ourselves and our preconceived notions that we have no room for God to work within us or to reach others through us. As the British poet Philip Britz observed, the Christ child is born in the poverty of our hearts. Let me say that again. The Christ child is born in the poverty of our hearts. Only when we recognize this poverty within our hearts do we leave room for discovering God's presence within ourselves and within others. Only when we acknowledge the poverty of our hearts can we accept that God will be present in new and unexpected ways and people. Having the heart of someone in need is the best way to prepare for Christ, not only at Christmas, but all through the year. Friends, this is the joyful feast of the people of God. They will come from east and west, from north and south, and sit at the table in the kingdom of God. According to Luke, when our risen Lord was at table with his disciples, he took the bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. This is the Lord's table. Our Savior invites those who trust him to share in the feast that he has prepared for us. Lord, it is truly right and our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise. O Lord, our God, creator and ruler of the universe, in your wisdom you made all things and sustained them by your power. You formed us in your image, setting us in this world to love and to serve you and to live in peace with your whole creation. When we rebelled against you, refusing to trust and obey you, you did not reject us, but still claimed us as your own. You sent prophets to call us back to your way. Then, 
in the fullness of time, out of your great love for the world, you sent your only Son to be one of us, to redeem us and heal our brokenness. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with choirs of angels, with prophets, apostles, and martyrs. And with all the faithful of every time and place, whoever forever sings the glory of your name, holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these, your gifts of bread and wine, that the bread we break and the cup we bless may be the communion of the body and blood of Christ. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, that we may be one with all who share this feast, united in ministry in every place, as this bread is Christ's body for us. Send us out to be the body of Christ in the world. Keep us faithful in your service until Christ comes in final victory and we shall feast with all your saints in the joy of your eternal realm. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor are yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. This is the body of Christ, the bread of life. This is the blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. Let us join together now at God's table and feast as one body. Let us pray. God of grace and peace, we thank you for sharing your life with us through the child in the manger and for this simple meal shared with the great company of the faithful of all times and places. By your Holy Spirit, empower us to share your life with others as the body of Christ in the world. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, who reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us now lift our voices in our closing hymn, number 145, What Child Is This? Oh, 
As we go forth from worship today and out into the mission field, it's my prayer that we will remember the words of Pastor William Barclay. The best way to prepare for the coming of Christ is never to forget the presence of Christ. God bless each and every one of you. Amen.